upon you but we know one who can his name is Jesus his name is Jesus he's the all forgiving one hallelujah he's the one who will find you whether you're on the mountain as the song said whether you're down in the valley there's Jesus he'll find you he'll pursue you he'll chase you down hallelujah he'll throw his arms around you and he'll love you And he'll say, come home, my child. Come home, come home, come home. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Close your eyes. Lift your hands up and say, oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Jesus. You're the only one. You're the only one. You're the only one. You're the only one. Come on, say you're the only one. You're the only one. You're the only one who can. Jesus, we bow in your presence. No one we confess it with joyful hearts, with thankful hearts. There's nothing that's better than you. Lord Jesus, we searched. We went to all the wrong watering holes. We participated in all the wrong activities. But then you showed up. You showed up. 
you came down to the well and you told us your story and you told us our story and you said come unto me and you'll never thirst again think of it never thirst again we thank you Jesus we thank you Jesus we take it in we take it in we receive it today Father, we pray for individuals far and wide, those that are close and those that are far off, that are struggling, that are in pain or in hurt, where their circumstances aren't pleasant, where they can't come into a sanctuary and sing these songs of Zion. But Lord, we know that you're there with them in their valleys. You're with them there in their situations. We think of the families that are in grief and in mourning in Chicago. Those, oh God, that say it was so senseless when the gunman came into the grocery store. We say, God, help them. God, would you comfort them? Holy Spirit, would you go and give them a ray of hope? We think of these families in Texas, oh God. We think of these families that have lost their children to some senseless act of evil. And we say, oh God, would you go and would you comfort them? Would you comfort them? Would you help them? Oh Lord Jesus, pour your spirit out upon them. Pour your spirit out upon them. Father, I think of the grandparents of the young man and the grief and the sorrow and the shame that they're carrying today. God, would you go and speak to them as well? Lord God, you love them. Your heart goes out to them. And so does ours. To the staff, to the community, help them to turn their eyes upon you, Lord Jesus to see your love and to see your grace and to see your mercy. Father God, we pray for our own community. We pray, Lord Jesus, for our situation. That, Lord God, you would stand between us and evil and you would give us a sensing to know that only you can do what's right. Oh, we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own ways, but you, God, came and found us. We thank you for it. We thank you for it. My assignment today is rather curt and to the point. But my assignment is to tell you, just do it. Just do it. Turn to somebody and say, just do it. As we look into the scripture and we discover how King David change the atmosphere in Israel, I believe that God wants us to change the atmosphere in our world as well. David didn't have to put up with the Philistines. He, he refused to submit to the Ammonites and the Amorites, etc., the Hivites and the Hittites. David rose above that and he said, no, we're going to do something different in Israel. We're going to bring the presence of God back into our community, into our nation, amen? And so he called the commanders of thousands and hundreds and fifties and tens. He called the Levites and he called those that were out in the pasture lands together. And he said, let's go get the Ark of the Covenant and bring the presence of God back into Jerusalem and let's worship God like we've never worshiped God before. And the Bible said it seemed good to the commanders. It seemed good to the Levites. It seemed good to the rank and file. And they all in one accord said, let's go do it. And so they went out to do it. And David set about to establish a brand new pattern of worship for Israel to follow. Remember, Israel had gotten sidetracked. And here they were going down to Egypt with Joseph and the 12 boys, just for a short duration. 
They thought it would just be for a little bitty season. But they ended up down in Egypt for over 400 years. There's a lesson there to be learned, church. Don't get sidetracked. You might be living through a famine right now. You might be going through heartache right now or hardship right now. But don't get sidetracked and end up wandering down into Egypt, as it were, going out into the world trying to find a solution to your problems. That's exactly what the woman at the well did. She got sidetracked. And she went out looking for love in all the wrong places. She ended up drinking at all the wrong wells until one day Jesus came and asked her for a drink. She said, well, you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan. You're asking me for a drink? He said to her, if you knew who I was, you would ask me for a drink and I would give you living water so that you never thirst again. Now that's a good deal. Amen. That's a good deal. But the woman had gotten sidetracked down in the world. She had married five times. The man that she was living with now wasn't even her sixth husband or her husband. And Jesus read her mail and she realized that she was in the presence of God. And she said, tell me more. Tell me more. I want to know Truth, I want to know where there is real love and forgiveness. And so you know the story how Jesus pointed her in the right direction. There's only one way to heaven. The Bible says it's through Jesus. Only one way. And so Joseph and the boys, they all got sidetracked. And they ended up down in Egypt for 400 years. I remember my time in Egypt, do you? It wasn't a good season. Most people that I talk to are never proud of their time in Egypt or the world, as we say. But they're so thankful that God got a hold of them, that God came down and he met them. And so God spoke to Moses, and Moses led the people out of Egypt, and it was an exciting time and a great opportunity and season for them. But now there is come a time in the life of Israel where there needs to be a change. There needs to be a shift. There needs to be something happen again at the heart level. Not just the intellectual level, but at the heart level. And so God calls David and he sets him in as king. And the Bible tells us that one of the very first things that David did as king was to start seeking after God in a brand new way. It's never too soon to start seeking God. You're never too big. You're never too high and mighty to seek God. David was the king, really, of a superpower in his day and hour. David was the one that was going out and conquering lands and bringing back plunder and bringing back gold and silver. It says that at the end of David's reign, there was gold and silver everywhere because of his exploits. But David was still seeking God. We started out on this journey and trying to understand why and how David worshiped God because we understood that John, the revelator, had gotten into the spirit. And when he got into the spirit, God spoke to him. That's what we're after, is to learn how to get into the spirit to stay in the Spirit so that we can hear from heaven, so that the Holy Spirit can speak to us on a very intimate and personal basis, all right? You see, God wants you as an individual to hear from heaven on your own, without me. You know, I, I ultimately become somewhat redundant in your life as a teacher, a pastor, a preacher, because if I make you a disciple, if I make you a student of the word, if I help you to grow in your faith, then you're going to hear from heaven. That doesn't mean that you're going to become lawless or independent or a rebel or a rabble rouser, but it means that you'll hear his voice and you'll be able to follow it and you'll be able to discern the difference between right and wrong, good and evil. 
This is what we're trying to do in the church. We're not trying to keep you down or under or in, in, a, in a lowly position. We're trying to get you into God so that you know that you have a confidence that Jesus Christ is Lord and he's Savior. And you can hear from him and you can follow him and you won't be wandering off after some other false god. So David said, let's do it. Let's do it. And so they all got together, the Bible says here, and we're back in 1 Chronicles, by the way, chapter 15. It's not always easy to shift momentum. It's not always easy to shift lifestyle. It's not always easy to figure out just how it is that I'm supposed to act in this new relationship. And David and the people of Israel hit a few bumps in the road, just like you and I have hit a few bumps every now and then. But that didn't stop them. They kept persisting and going on. And so David's tabernacle, this tent of meeting that he had developed and he had pinched, pitched a special tent in Jerusalem. And this is where ultimately Solomon's tabernacle was going to be built. So there's a little rhyme and reason to this. If you were to look at the topography right now of Israel, you would find that where David pitched his tent and where they brought the Ark of the Covenant to ultimately, where Solomon built his temple is now where the mosque of Omar sits. And it's a disputed piece of real estate where the Muslims say this is our holy ground the Jews say, no, this is our holy ground. And we Christians get in there somewhere and say, yes, we know that it's holy ground. Amen. So if you wonder where this tabernacle of David was or where this tent was, if you Google it, you'll see the Mosque of Omar, the golden dome sitting there. If you've ever been to Israel, you probably got down to the wailing wall, to the western wall, and up above it and on top is where David's tabernacle was. I was thrilled when I went there and they said, this is the city of David. And you could see the walls. and You could see, you know, some of the architect. And it was still there from 4,000 plus years ago when David was king. Think of it, church. There's continuity. There's history. Well, David came along and he said, we're going to alter our worship. I know what it is to alter worship. I know what it is to try to shift cultures. I know what it is to try to get people to move into a new realm, into a new idea, or into a new concept. David's tabernacle was different than Moses. There was no altar in David's tabernacle. Hello? Hello? There was no altar on which to sacrifice bulls and goats. There was no brazen laver at which to wash the utensils and the artifacts. The ark wasn't hidden back in the Holy of Holies behind a veil and behind a thick curtain. But rather the ark of the covenant where the mercy seat was and where God's presence abode was sitting right out in broad daylight, in the open, just like it is today. See, God isn't in hiding today, church. A lot of the world is, has this concept that God's in hiding. I'm here to tell you, God's not in hiding. God is in full array. And if you'll open your spiritual eyes, and if you'll press in with your heart, you'll find God, and he'll find you. And so this was David's concept. He didn't want God hidden behind this veil or this curtain that Moses called the Holy of Holies. He wanted the presence of God to be out in the wide open so that everybody could enjoy the goodness of God, his grace and his mercy. That's why David could write, surely goodness and mercy have followed me all the days of my life. Because he knew that wherever he went, God went with him. In fact, God was there before he got there. And I'm here to tell you that 
God is always here before you get here. You're never going to get up and surprise God and say, oh, I beat God. No, he's going to beat you every time. This tabernacle that David was building was going to be totally different in the way they worshipped. The music was going to be different. There were going to be trumpets. It wasn't always a solemn occasion. It wasn't always a, 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 a sorrowful atmosphere. But David wanted it to be an atmosphere that he believed God lived in. And that was an atmosphere of love and joy and excitement. And so he had trumpeters and he had those that could play the lyre, which was sort of a stringed instrument. Lots of guitars, hallelujah. He had harps. He had pianos. Well, no, he had harps. We turned the harp on its side and turned it into a piano. But he had harps, okay? And um, he had, uh, what else? He had cymbals. I think we still have a, a cymbal that probably was uh, uh, akin to what David had. They just make a lot of noise, right? And he had drums and he had singing and he had dancing, hallelujah. He didn't just have one Henry. He had a thousand Henrys, hallelujah. <laughs> I would that you were all Henry's. <laughs> I would that you all could, you know, exercise and do your Holy Ghost aerobics. And so in verse 16 of chapter 15, if you're there, it says, David told the leaders of the Levites to appoint their brothers and singers to sing. Just do it. But, you know, can't you imagine some of these Levites looking back at at their elders, at their brothers, who were appointing them to sing and say, ah, you haven't heard me sing, my friend. <laughs> you haven't heard me. I, I don't even sing in the shower. You haven't heard me. No, the Bible says they just appointed them to be singers. Before the morning is over, I'm going to ordain you and commission you and appoint you all to be singers. Amen. I don't care if you can carry a tune or not but you got to learn how to make a joyful noise unto the Lord. And all of a sudden, these Levites were thrust into an area of ministry and responsibility that they hadn't been used to. They'd been used to ministering in the tabernacle. They'd prepared the sacrifices. They had washed the instruments. They had looked after the brazen altar. They had looked after the brazen labor. They had guarded the Holy of Holies, but they weren't singers. Hello? Amen. But David said, from here on in, I need you to be singers. I need you to be worshipers. I need you to get out of your shell and out of your normalcy, and I need you to become different and do that which is different. I need you to be singers. And so they were appointed to be singers. And that's why I said, just do it. Just do it. Just do it. And so as we look at verse 16, it says they were appointed to sing joyful songs accompanied by musical instruments on the lyres, the harps and the cymbals. And then in verse 17, it says that the Levites appointed Heman, son of Joel, from his brothers, Asaph, son of Barak from their brothers, the Mariites. Do you remember who the Mariites are? The Bible says here that, that they were appointed to do something special in this tabernacle of David. They were appointed to do a task that they had never done before. See, if you go back and you study this family and their responsibilities, it says that they were designated to perform a particular function in the tabernacle of Moses. No, no, they, they didn't get to carry the ark. They didn't get to carry the badger skins. They didn't get to carry the precious utensils. They didn't get to carry the beams and the rods and the poles. The Bible says to the Myriad clan, they were designated to carry the tent pegs. What do you mean the tent pegs? God, you know, I'm surely I'm, I'm better, you know, equipped than just to go out there and pick tent pegs out of the ground and to carry them. Let me ask you a question. Anybody here ever gone camping? 
You get out there late in the afternoon, you pop the trunk of the car open, you pull the tent out and you're all ready to set up the tent and then you look under everything in there, you move the picnic baskets and you move the sleeping bags and finally you turn around and say, where in the world are the tent pegs? <laughs> yeah, some of you have been there and done that and you know what it is. That tent ain't going to stay up <laughs> without the tent pegs. You might think the most important job is carrying the ark. You might think the most important job is herding the cattle. You might think the most important job is setting up the tabernacle proper. But listen, if you don't get on the scene at the right time with the tent pegs, nothing's going to happen. And I can just envision these guys going through the wilderness, carrying these heavy tent pegs and thinking to themselves, you know, Man, I'm tired. These things are so heavy and they're so big. Surely, you know, we don't need them and, and, and we could compromise or we could figure out another way, something else to do and just sit down under a tree and forget the tent pegs until they got to where the glory cloud stopped and they were setting up the tabernacle and Moses turns around and he says to the Mushiites, where are the tent pegs? Now we know the end of the story. These fellows never lost the tent pegs in the wilderness. If there was however many tent pegs there were, they picked every one of them up. They had them sharpened. They had them ready to go and hold the ropes in place the next time they set up camp. They were on top of it. And you know, because they were on top of it and because they weren't ashamed and they weren't ornery and they weren't grumbling about carrying the tent pegs, when the time and the right opportunity came, God said, appoint them to be singers in my house. It might start, your life might start carrying tent pegs. Your life might start by picking up the garbage outside the sanctuary. Your life might start by straightening out the pews or vacuuming the sanctuary or, God forbid, having to wash the toilets. Maybe that's where your life will start. But I'll tell you something. If you'll be faithful in the little things, God will elevate you and promote you in due season. And I see these individuals as the Miriites. And it just blew me away when I discovered that when the Levites and they were appointing singers, that they got a promotion. And all of a sudden, instead of carrying those old tent pegs, now they were singers people that could lift their hands and people that could lift their voices and they could worship God with all their heart, with all their mind, with all their soul and with all their strength. Whatsoever thou doest, the Bible says, do it joyfully unto the Lord. Amen? The character that was developed in them, it stood them in good stead. The little jobs that you're appointed to, carrying the tables out for the, you know, the agape feasts, hauling the chairs in after, you know, everybody else has packed up and gone home for the afternoon and you're still out there picking up garbage and picking up chairs and getting them back into the right place. Think of it. If you'll do the lowly things, God will anoint you to do something different in the future. And so we go down here and we find something else. We find that this individual, as they were talking about those with responsibilities, and finally, in about verse 18, it, it comes to the place where it says, and Obadiah and Jael, I want you to appoint them to be gatekeepers. Think of it. Who's Obadiah? Obadiah is just a farm boy. Obadiah was, you know, on the backside. He was Obadiah the Gittite. That means he came from a particular area of, of Israel. It wasn't the most prestigious area. Really, he was on the wrong side of the tracks. You got the picture? This was Obadiah, the Gittite, the land of Gath, the land of the giants, the land where Goliath came from and his five big brothers. It wasn't the place that most of the Israelites wanted to go and hang out in. But this is where Obadiah had his farm. And the Bible tells us that when David and the 
commanders and all of Israel was trying to bring the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem, remember they did it the way that everybody else was doing it. You can't just serve God the way everybody else is serving God and think that you're going to get to your right destination. All paths do not lead to heaven. I want to go on record. All religions don't end up in the same heaven. Just because somebody's saying their prayers and down on their knees or facing east or doing this or doing that doesn't mean, oh, they might be sincere in their heart, but all paths do not lead to heaven. You and I have an op- obligation. We have a responsibility to let the world know that there's one name under heaven whereby man must be saved, and that is the name of Jesus. Jesus. They might call you a bigot. They might say you're narrow-minded. They might say that you're being picky. So be it. Smile at them. Love them and tell them you're not trying to be mean. You're not trying to offend them. But you're standing on the word of God. There's only one name. His name is Jesus. And every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Obadiah was just a farm boy from Gittite. But you know why he was elevated? Because when David... And Israel was bringing the Ark of the Covenant back up from Kareth Jemirah. The Bible says that the oxen stumbled. And Uzzah reached out to steady the Ark, thinking that he could steady the move of God. And the Bible says that he was smitten and he died right there. And David put the brakes on everything and said, this is it. And he was right there in front of Obadiah's farm. And he said, let's just move the cart off the road, get it up here by the barn, and just maybe leave it sit there for a while. Nobody else wanted to touch the ark. Nobody else wanted to have the Ark of the Covenant, you know, on their farm. Nobody else was willing to open the doors and bring them in. But Obadiah said, yes, you can bring the Ark of the Covenant onto my my, my yard. Yes, you can park it here in my barn or in my shed. Yes, you can do that. I'll watch over it. I'll guard it. I'll protect it. I want God's presence in my house and in my life too. And so this farm boy called Obadiah opened his gates and opened his yard and opened his family and opened his life up to looking after the presence of God. And now when the Ark of the Covenant is moved from Obadiah's farm up into Jerusalem to the tent of David. The Bible says that God said, I want Obadiah to now be a gatekeeper in the house of the Lord. Don't be afraid to do the little jobs. Don't be afraid to do that which nobody else wants to do. Don't say, no, that's beneath my dignity. That's beneath my dignity. And don't worry about getting a promotion. God will promote you in due time. Promotion comes from the Lord. Not just because you've got your volunteer badge. Not just because you've done this, that, and the other thing 155 times over the course of the last 10 years. No, promotion comes from the Lord. I hate to give you this news, but, you know, if you understand the analogy of the body of Christ... You know, the the Bible talks about the family of God being the body of Christ. All of us can't be the nose. All of us can't be the ears. Some of us are the elbow. (laughs) Some of us are the funny bone on the elbow. Y'all got a funny bone? (laughs) Just hope that you don't hit it. You'll probably scream like a baby. Why do they call it a funny bone when it hurts so much when you bang it? But anyhow, I just say this to say, listen, God will promote you in due season. Verse 19, the musicians, Haman, Asaph, and Ethan, were to sound the bronze cymbal. And here's Obadiah again, and he's supposed to be playing the harp. This guy, I thought he was a farmer. Now he's a doorkeeper. No, he's not just the doorkeeper. He's going to get to play the harp as well. 
This guy is multifaceted, multifunctional. That's why some of you, you know, I've always said, you know, if you need a job done in the church, find a busy person. Maybe that's what God was doing. He, he knew that there was a lot to be done and he knew that Obadiah was always willing and always up to the task. And so now he's a doorkeeper. Now he's a heart player. Hallelujah. And he's just going to give us all for God. Amen. Nothing can keep Obadiah down. Nothing's going to stop him from doing and giving his very best for God. Listen, church, I'm throwing out a plea for you. We need skillful musicians. We need skillful singers. We need people that know how to sing harmony. We need people that aren't afraid to come and, 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 and take their music and just give it to the Lord and end up being worshipers that just happen to be skillful singers. I'm more interested in somebody standing on the platform with a worshiping heart than good harmony. Okay? I, I want people to have the ability to sing harmony. But the most important thing is for people to be worshipers and to give their hearts to the Lord and to love them with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength. Well, this guy called Kenaniah, verse 22, singing. That was his responsibility because he was skillful at it. And then it goes on and it talks about a couple of guys that were appointed to be doorkeepers. And then it talked about some other individuals that were appointed to blow on the trumpets. And then, guess what? Obadiah shows up again. And now he's not just a gatekeeper. He's not just playing the harp. Now he's also promoted to being a doorkeeper for the ark. I would have liked to have met, and I'm going to meet Obadiah someday. Maybe we'll have something in common, the fact that we were both raised on the farm. And he loved to worship, and he loved to serve, and he loved to give. And all of Israel got together, the Bible says, and they went from the house of Obadiah up to the tabernacle of David, to the tent, to Zion. The Bible says, with great rejoicing, because God had helped the Levites carry the Ark of the Covenant. I thought, sometimes when we come in to the tabernacle, into the house of the Lord, we get in here with a rotten attitude. And we sort of think to ourselves, I don't have anything to praise God about today. Excuse me? You know, I, I just not in the mood today. Excuse me? You know, I don't have that passion today. Come on, church. The Bible says that David and all Israel, they were so excited and they danced before the Ark of the Covenant all the way from the house of Obadiah up to Zion. And it says the reason they did it is because God had helped them. Has God helped anybody here? Come on. Has God helped anybody here? Say an amen. Say a hallelujah. If God's your helper, then you don't need any other reason. You don't need any other excuse. You don't need any other motivation to praise the Lord than the fact that God helped you. And the Bible says because God had helped the Levites carry the Ark of the Covenant to carry the presence of God from the house of Obadiah up to Jerusalem. They were all excited and they were all worshiping and they were all rejoicing. A group that we had in our church a long time ago, back in the 70s, when we were down on 93rd Street, and they were called the Cameron Singers, the Cameron Brothers. They were from Scotland. They wore kilts to church. And their song that they were the most famous for was, Thou Has Turned My Morning Into Dancing For Me. I was listening to their story and their testimonies once. They were down in, I believe it was Florida, and um, it was when... Uh, a television studio had just opened up and I don't remember which one it was <clears throat> and they had invited them to come in and sing the last half hour before they went off air because they didn't think that they were very good was the bottom line so they thought well we'll put them on at 1130 just for the last half hour before we shut everything down for the night and as the story goes they started to sing about David dancing before the Lord and the anointing of God broke down into that little studio and they kept singing it and they sang that same song
for something like three hours straight. And before the lights shut out in that studio, over 300 people had driven from all over the city to come down to the studio and get saved. Why? Because they were carrying the presence of God. They were singing unto the Lord. They were creating an atmosphere for God to come and sit on the throne of their hearts. Amen. That's what we're doing. You're not just singing for me. You're not singing for you. You're singing for God. That's why we pull out the stops. That's why we lay aside our inhibitions. That's why we close our eyes if we have to so that we don't uh, get distracted. Lift up your hands. Lift up your feeble knees. Dance, sing, and rejoice before the Lord. And when you do, you're singing for the audience of one. His name is Jesus. And God hears you. And God responds to that. And the anointing comes and settles on you. And you become one of those Levites that is carrying the presence of God. Amen. The Bible says, and when Jesus breathed on them, he blew on them. He said, receive the Holy Ghost. <laughs> receive the Holy Ghost. Let the wind of God blow over you. Let the breath of God blow over you. Blow over you, blow over you, blow over you, blow over you, blow over you. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. The Bible says with shouts and with singing and with dancing and with great adoration, with the ram's horns blowing and with trumpets blaring, with cymbals clanging, and with the leers and the harps, there was joy in the camp, hallelujah. Joy, joy, joy.